This young indigenous woman was failed by just so many people. Hello, true crimeers. This is a missing or murdered indigenous woman case, and this is the case of Tina Fontaine. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, hello, I'm Mike. If you're new here, I tell true crime stories thrice weekly, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, so please subscribe if you're into that kind of thing, you big weirdo, mink weirdo pants. That was dumb and mean, and also I'm sorry for calling you a name. <laughs> anyway, also, if you want shorter form true crime stories, I tell them over on TikTok. I tell at least one of those a day. You can find all the information about how to get to my TikTok in the description of this video below. It's written out and it's also in the link tree. I also have a Discord server that you're more than welcome to join, but you better be over the age of 18 because if we find out you're not, we will kick you out. Sorry. And we also sell merch. I ship all over this entire world. It's also linked in the link tree below. And then lastly, if there's a case you would like me to cover, please just email me. My email is listed below as well. It's Mikey at truecrimer.com. Just email me the name of the person, where it happened, when it happened, and then I can add that name to my list. It may take me a while to get to that case because I picked the cases at random. And I have over 5,200 names on there, so just be patient. It will happen eventually. I just can't tell you when. But let's get into... What is this? <laughs> but no. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get into today's story. Tina Michelle Fontaine was born on January 1st, 1999. She was a member of the Saking First Nation, which is in the Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba in Canada. Tina was one of eventually eight children from what I understand. Her biological mother, uh, Valentina Duck, she was heavily into uh, drugs, alcohol. Tina's mom herself had been run through the foster care system most of her young life. And there are allegations that Valentina Duck was being sexually exploited, used from a very early age. Duck met Tina Fontaine's father, Eugene, when Duck was just 12 years old. He himself started to get involved in drugs and alcohol and that kind of thing when he was just like 11 or 12 years old. And for a while, for a long while, he was living on the streets. He was basically just this homeless kid. And uh, he was 23 years old when he met the 12 year old uh, Duck. And Duck was 14 when they when she gave birth to their first child. And then after that is when Tina Fontaine came into the world. Duck, I guess, had accused Eugene of using Tina from a young age to sexually exploit her and financially gain from that, if you know what I mean. So I guess this was told to Child and Family Services, or CFS, and uh, a person, an employee, went to the home to investigate this, but they didn't really do anything about it. They just sort of left it as is. There was a time after Tina was born where Duck and Eugene were trying to turn their lives around, trying to get off drugs, trying to become an actual family and, and better everything but because of the stress of raising kids and all that and they just fell right back into the scene back when tina was just uh, a very very young child like one or two years old and her sister was like less than a year old they were taken by cfs because duck and eugene hadn't picked the kids up from their grandmother's house when they were supposed to and required to. So a couple of the children were put into the foster system, but within less than a week, they were put right back into the care of Duck and Eugene. Just a year later, the children were taken by CFS again because Duck and Eugene were at a party doing drugs, drinking a lot of alcohol, 
and the kids were there, and they 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 were seen basically drunkenly falling out of this house with the kids right behind them. The foster care system, I guess, in Canada around that time, I'm not 100% positive, but apparently there just wasn't enough places to put foster kids. So they started using hotels to put these kids in. So they were out of the care of Duck and Eugene. And then Duck and Eugene, they separated, they broke up. Their relationship was finally over. And for whatever reason, the kids were then put back into Eugene's care, but he couldn't handle it. Uh, and so then the kids were put into the care of Thelma and Joseph Favell, um, which in Thelma is the girl's great aunt, but I guess they would kind of refer to her, the girls would, as grandma. So their house was on the Saking First Nation Reservation, and at that point, everything seemed to be going much better for the children. Uh, they were happy, they were being taken care of, they were being fed, they were in school. Tina Fontaine was doing amazing in school. She was getting really good grades. Um, she had friends. She was really on this kind of path to finally be on the road to a good life. Tina's Aunt Thelma would say, any good word there is out there to basically describe someone, those good words describe Tina. She was this perfect little angel. But Thelma and her husband, they were not, they weren't really equipped to properly, you know, take care of all of these kids. And so they had asked CFS for help. Like, we need assistance. But Thelma really had a hard time getting CFS to help in any way, shape, or form. Thelma believed that Tina was had suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome and she wanted to see if CFS would provide like or help get her tested for these things and CFS never got back to her, never responded to her. Just like they just didn't care. She repeatedly asked them for help and they never responded to her. In 2011, um, Tina is now, I believe, 12 years old and her father, Eugene, is murdered. Um, he is brutally beaten to death. This was done by two men. The two men were arrested and they would go to trial and I believe they were convicted of that murder. All of the progress that Tina had made um, in turning stuff around, becoming this, this wonderful young girl who was on her way to doing big things in her life, um, very smart, sweet, innocent, all of that kind of began to crumble when her father was murdered. Understandably, I mean, I get it. This is when Tina started to show like, you know, mental health issues, possibly depression, a an onslaught of issues that would come from a 12 year old girl learning her father was brutally beaten to death. She started uh, not going to school. She was skipping school when, you know, she wouldn't go show up when she was supposed to. Thelma believed that CFS and other organizations that were designed to help children in these situations, she asked them for help. Like she needs you know, these girls, they need counseling. This is a, they need help because of what happened to their father, but they didn't help. They didn't, the C CFS and they didn't, these victim organizations didn't do shit. They didn't do anything. They didn't offer them counseling or anything like that. The Manitoba's Advocate for Children and Youth uh, Organization, they said that in the three years after Eugene was murdered, victim services neither met directly with Tina, nor did they ever even bother to arrange a single counseling session for, you know, for Tina to help get through this level of grief. Not once. Thelma began to basically realize that Tina was into drugs now. And she was possibly meeting with men, like grown adult men, strangers, off the internet and also on the streets. Thelma, again, who wasn't, she was not equipped to kind of take all of this when this all first happened in terms of her getting all the kids, but she did it because she wanted to make sure they had some kind of good life, but she also just wasn't really prepared and equipped for it. And so she went to Child and Family Services again, even though they basically have failed her at every turn. And they said, listen, I don't have, I don't, I'm not equipped to handle this. This young girl who is 
possibly on drugs and alcohol, who's meeting men online. Like, I, I don't have, I can't, I, she needs help. Nothing. They did nothing. They apparently finally came and met with Tina, but in their report, they didn't mention any of that stuff, any of the drugs, any of the meeting men online. They left that all out of their report. Tina was then asked by the, I guess, the, the prosecutors of the courts um, involved with the, you know, Eugene's murder, if she would write a victim impact statement. And this just sort of made her crumble more. I mean, like now I have to, now I have to write a statement about the murder of my father. She didn't know how to write a victim impact statement. Thelma tried to help her. And then Thelma also said, hey, CFS, can you maybe help with this? Crickets. They told them that we don't get involved in the personal lives of these children. Now, at this point, and the, it, Tina hadn't seen her biological mom, Duck, in years. But when this murder happened and the victim impact statement scenario came into play, Duck basically came back into Tina's life, tried to. But Thelma would contact CFS again after many attempts have failed uh, and ask them like, listen, you know, can you look into Duck to make sure that Tina is okay to visit her? Apparently they did. And apparently they gave her the go ahead to she's okay to visit Duck. And I guess she started, from what I understand, I guess she started staying with her, with Duck. But the reality is, is Duck's life hadn't changed at all. And so Tina apparently began like literally living on the streets and then going in and out of hotels that CFS would put her in. Tina was reported missing eight times. And this was in, I guess, June through the end of July of 2014. So, so eight different times. And uh, she's just, she's never located. But then on August 8th, 2014, two officers pull over a vehicle because the driver is clearly drunk. And lo and behold, whoever that man was, I'm not sure, driving the car, but Tina was in the car. A 15 year old girl was in the car. She had been reported missing eight times. Apparently they saw her and I, I'm, I'm assuming asked for her name. They should have put her into some kind of like computer to know she was missing, but I guess they didn't do that. And so she was just let go. She was just released by these cops. That the morning afterwards, she was found in an alleyway, passed out. She was drunk. She was taken to a hospital where she was cared for. She was then put into one of the uh, CFS, you know, hotel rooms. I believe it was at a Best Western. But there was no adults in the room with her and there was no one supervising her at all. And so on August 8th, 2014, that day, that was the last day anyone ever saw her again. And then on August 17th, 2014, there was a plastic, a large plastic bag found floating in the Red River. The bag was uh, attached to like large rocks that was meant to weigh this bag down into the river. When they open the bag, there is a duvet cover. It's wrapped around something. They unwrap it and it's a body. It was the body of a young girl who would later be identified as 15 year old Tina Fontaine. Police began to investigate her comings and goings and when interviewing, uh, I guess, people, witnesses, they were told about a man, a 55 year old man named Raymond Cormier. Tina had frequented like, uh, I guess a particular house where there were like, I'm assuming parties being thrown. And this man was at those parties a lot. And so Raymond and Tina, they knew each other to a degree. Witnesses would place Raymond Cormier with Tina Fontaine, I guess a couple of times in the days leading up to her eventual death. By the way, they have never determined Tina's cause of death. They don't know how she died. There are people who, who even say that they can't prove that she was killed by an unlawful act. But 
someone put her in that river because she was she didn't wrap her own self up in a duvet cover, put herself into a bag, tie that bag up, attach rocks to it, and throw it in the river. Someone did that. Doesn't mean that someone killed her, no. Possibly she died in this person's care and didn't want to deal with the legal repercussions and so maybe they disposed of her. I don't know, but they have never determined her cause of death. They said they can't rule out drowning, they can't rule out suffocation, they can't, they can't, there's so many things they can't rule out because she had been in that river, they said, for about a week and a lot of evidence was gone. They could determine, I guess, that she was sexually assaulted, but there was no DNA found anywhere. And the water she was exposed to kind of washed away any potential evidence. When, so Raymond Cormier was arrested because of all of the circumstantial evidence that he was seen with her. And many people say that she, that Tina was last seen with Raymond and then she disappeared. This is when apparently the Mr. Big operation comes into play. Mr. Big operation is a big thing in Canada. Essentially, it's when the uh, undercover, you know, investigators try to lure in one of their suspects by pretending they're like a criminal organization. They're not cops. They're, uh, you know, and they lure this criminal in and try to say, hey, if you want to join this criminal organization, you have to tell us something you've done. Tell us something illegal you've done so we have something on you. It's been used before successfully. It's also been used before unsuccessfully. Apparently, and there's a lot of like, a lot of big questions about whether or not this is really a good tactic to use. To me, it's kind of like no different than getting a false confession out of a suspect by detectives in an interrogation room. It's kind of the same thing. But at any rate, they have, I guess, recordings of Raymond Cormier saying some very questionable things. So he was on recording saying, quote, 15 year old girl, fuck. I drew the line and that's why she got killed. She got killed, I'll make you a bet. She got killed because we found out. I found out she was only 15 years old, end quote. Another quote, he said, caught on audio. Quote, you ever been haunted by something? What happened there really fucking, it's not right, fuck. It's right on the shore, so what do I do? Threw her in, unquote. And then a third quote, quote, I did Tina, fucking supposed to be legal and only 15. No going back to. The cops said if there would have been DNA and probably they would have had enough evidence to charge, you know that, for the murder of Tina Fontaine, unquote. It sounded like he was confessing to killing her, um, but at the same time, there is a lot of vagueness in those statements. Basically, Raymond Cormier was saying that he said those things as like a hypothetical. I don't know what that really means, but he said those things. And so you gotta take them for what, for what they were. So the speculation that the Crown, who is the prosecution in Canada, what they essentially came up with was that Raymond and Tina had interactions together at these house parties. And eventually this led to them possibly doing drugs and drinking together. And he by chance probably had sex with her. They then think he found out after the fact that she was only 15 and he got really pissed about that for her not telling him and then he killed her. So he's actually charged with her murder. He's charged with second degree murder and he goes to trial. The issue is, is the Crown had no physical evidence whatsoever tying him to this crime. There was no DNA, there was no fingerprints, no hair samples, nothing. Uh, the duvet cover uh, was I guess similar to a duvet or identical to a duvet cover that Raymond owned wherever he lived. I don't know if that means he used his to wrap her up and then bought a new one to make it look like he never, like it never left his house or whatever. I don't know, but the recordings when, you know, he said, I did Tina. He did not say I killed Tina. I murdered her. He never really said he directly ended her life. And his wordings can be interpreted as, as a hypothetical, as a he just sort of, what, if I was that person, what would I have done? But in the closing arguments at the trial, the, the prosecutor would say, Raymond's own words told you what he did. 
that he identified himself as the killer of Tina Fontaine. They brought up witnesses to say that Raymond had made sexual advances towards Tina prior a couple of times. His defense said there's no way of pro proving she died through an unlawful act, meaning there's no way of proving she was murdered. But then you have that, okay, but she was wrapped in a duvet, put into a bag, tied with rocks, thrown in the, in the river. That, impl that implicates foul play, at least disposing of a body. Who did that part? And so that's where it kind of comes in, like maybe she accidentally died. Maybe there was an overdose. You know, did something happen because she was so intoxicated? Did something accidentally happen? Well, there's no way of proving that either. There was no way of proving either side. They had nothing physical to say what happened to her to end her life. Separate from someone put her in the river in that condition, that's one thing, but how did she get to that that place where she's dead? And they couldn't show or prove how that happened. So in February of 2018, Raymond Cormier uh, was found not guilty of the murder. And there was a lot of understandable uh, outrage afterwards because this is yet another indigenous or aboriginal woman who was murdered um, or who goes missing that does not get justice. Uh, once again, this happens a lot in Canada, uh, just as badly as it happens here in the United States. The prosecution then announced that they will not be going forward with appealing the, the verdict and that they're basically just done with Raymond. And another indigenous woman, a very young woman, 15 years old, hasn't gotten justice. Tina Fontaine was failed. Child and Family Services, didn't provide that help, didn't really care for Tina Fontaine, didn't do much of anything. And so even after being involved in drugs and drinking and sex work and parties and all of this stuff, not showing up to school, CFS did not step in when they should have. Many times they didn't. She was failed. Had they come in to help her, had they come in to, to fix the situation, Tina may not have gone down this path that eventually led to whatever cause of death happened to her. But someone put her in that river. A person put her in that river. A person put her in that bag, wrapped in a duvet cover, and threw her in the river with rocks. Someone did that. That person, whoever it may be, has not been held accountable. And there doesn't seem to be any desire to hold anyone accountable for it at this point. Because, hey, Indigenous young girl went down the wrong path in life. She died from it. Oh well. That's kind of like the mentality you get. Something unlawful happened to her in some way, shape, or form, and no one has been held accountable for it. No one's gotten in any trouble for it. She was 15 years old. And at this point, Tina Fontaine is just another tick on a large tabulation of ticks that go, that just get pushed to the side. She is just another number. She is just one tiny part of the massive statistics. And Tina Fontaine did not get the justice or the help she should have gotten. But sadly, that is it for this case. True crime or Rooney Dooney's Dingle Berry Dongs. Uh, what? I failed that. I don't know what to tell you uh, about this one. It's frustrating, but um, I hope you found it interesting, I guess. Maybe one day she'll get justice, hopefully. Like I said at the beginning, uh, please make sure you subscribe if you like to hear true crime stories thrice weekly and daily over on TikTok. All the links below in the link tree in this description of this video below. Okay, okay. Um, what? <laughs> and what? You stop it. You hang up. You say goodbye. I'm not saying goodbye. <laughs> you guys do it. Come on, I can't do it. You s say goodbye, please, because I don't know how. Just click the X. Click the little X. Swipe. 
up or down or turn off your phone or computer or wherever you're watching this, just turn it off to make me stop doing this, to make me stop being awkward and not knowing what to do. It's just do it. Hi, uh, it's my Halloween costume. What am I? <clears throat> Are you still here? You can't see me. I'm in disguise. I am a seriously flawed individual with many mental health issues, and I probably need severe amounts of help. Uh, 